Amen. I believe we can all hear me. We are welcome to Believers Hangouts again tonight. As always, it's so good to see every one of us, both the regular comers <laughs> and, the good, and those who go and come. I can see some, some people who have not been here in a while. But it's so good to see every one of us again tonight. And I just pray that as we have come together, the Lord whom we have come to see will truly give us an unforgettable encounter in his presence in the name of Jesus. Um, as always, I just want to encourage us to pay rapt attention. Let's not allow any form of distraction where this word is going on. You know, wherever you are, please let your full attention be here at this time. We only have about 45 minutes or so left in the meeting tonight. Let's just give it our best so that we can receive maximally from the Lord tonight. And I just pray the Lord will us in Jesus' name. So last week we started a new series. Um, for those who were not here last week, we started a new series titled Discerning the Signs of the Times. And we did talk about a lot of different things last week. But the goal of this series in general is to help us as believers to build discernment. And I did define discernment last week as the ability to perceive the truth behind any situation, no matter how it actually appears physically. And, you know, the subject of discernment is something that is very critical because every believer who, who, who does not understand or who does not maximize this potential they will be greatly limited in their work on the earth. And the reason is because, you know, like I did explain last week, we are at war, all right? The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And this enemy we are at war with is strategizing every day. The devil is planning for you every single day. And the Bible makes us understand that the devil only has three agendas. And that is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. You can find that in John chapter 10, verse 10. And so if you are going to be victorious on earth, you must outsmart the devil. And the principal mechanism that God has made available for us to be able to outsmart the devil, so that no matter what he does to you, at the end of the day, all things will still work together for your good. The principal mechanism that God has made available for that possibility is through this gift of discernment. Now, I did not say this last week, but when we are talking about this subject of discernment, this is not the same thing as, you know, the, the gift of the spirit known as discerning of spirit. That's that's a separate thing, you know, and it's so maybe one of these days we'll, we'll talk about that. But in general sense, what the gift of discerning of spirit simply means or what, how it works is just that it gives you the capacity to discern what kind of spirit is in operation, whether it's the Holy Spirit, whether it's a human spirit, or whether it's a demonic spirit. That's generally the scope of that operation. But the, the concept of discernment in itself is um, a spiritual possibility that is available to us that enables us to be able to decipher the actual truth behind every situation. And this is made possible by the ministry of the Holy Spirit on our inside. Remember, the Bible calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. And it says, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. The word truth in that scripture also means reality. It will show you the, the true reality behind that situation. And I just pray that the Lord will help us, that this discernment we are talking about, every single one of us will be able to build it and maximize it in the name of Jesus. Now, last week... um. We focused mainly on why discernment is so important. We focused on the benefits of discernment. Please, if you were not here last week, go ahead and listen to the teaching. It's available. Both the full live stream and the cropped version is available on the channel. So please do well and listen to it. It's very, very important. Now, I'll just run over some of the points that we discussed last week before we go um, into the teaching for tonight. So, Last week, we talked about four main benefits of the sermon. The first one we looked at was that it helps us to avoid distractions. It helps avoid distractions. We read Acts chapter 6 from verses 1 to 4 last week. And what the Bible says there was that as the church began to grow, you know, the early church, you know, after the ascension of Christ, when the, you know, newly minted apostles gathered together, they began to evangelize and then people began to, you know, surrender their hearts to Jesus. 
starting from the day of Pentecost that Peter gave, you know, a, gave a message, and then 3,000 people came to the Lord. And then on another occasion, he gave another message. Another 5,000 came to the Lord, you know, and then the Bible says the Lord added to the church daily. So as that multiplication happened, Satan was looking for how he can reduce the efficiency of the apostles, how he can distract them from their main assignments and to get them to focus on other things that look good, but is not the core assignment that God has given them. And so what happened was that Satan began to incite some people, you know, and then some people began to complain and say, oh, they are not giving us food, you know, we are not getting proper welfare, we are not getting equal treatment and all of that. And then people began to grumble and complain. And then they brought this issue to the apostles. And immediately they brought that issue to the apostles because they were spiritual people. They were able to discern instantly that, no, 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 this is not just an administrative issue. This is not just an issue of welfare. This is the devil trying to distract us from our main assignment and getting us to settle for less than what God has actually called us to do. So the apostle said, no, it is not reasonable for us to leave the word of God and now begin to attend to issues about food and drinks. He said, so look among you, look for competent people, look for seven of them filled with the Holy Ghost and wisdom, bring them to us. We will commission this assignment to them. And there are lots of lessons we can learn there. One of them is delegation, the, the, the wisdom of not doing everything by yourself. You know, and I did talk a little bit about that last week, that as we grow, as God increases us both spiritually and financially, the assignment of that growth is supposed to provide a leverage for us so that we can give other people other assignments so that we can focus more on the principal things that God has called us to do. There is a little level of financial prosperity that God brings you to that it no longer makes sense for you to be catching the bus every day to work because you can afford to buy a car. You can afford to make your commute time to be shorter by leveraging the financial resources that you have. So it's very important for us to protect our focus as much as possible. And discernment is one of the principal tools that can help us to accomplish this. As we go through life, there are many distractions that Satan will bring to us every single day. Many, Most of the time, they will look good. They will be legitimate things. They will be reasonable. But when you weigh those things, side by side with the actual things God has called you to do or the actual things that will allow you to grow both in your purpose and destiny and overall as a person, you will discover that most of the things we give our time to on a daily basis actually qualify as distractions because at the end of the day, they do not add anything to us. They do not help us grow spiritually. They do not help us to be stronger in our ability to fulfill our purpose and our calling. So at the end of the day, it's just a means through which the devil wants to sidetrack us. But when we build that discernment, we are able to pick those things and we are able to avoid them. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. The second benefit to look at was that it can help us to avert great losses. And we read from Acts chapter 27, verses 1 to 15 last week. That was a story of the shipwreck that happened to Paul and, you know, his company. You know, Paul was supposed to be transported to Rome to go and stand judgment before Caesar. And then as he began the journey, you know, different kinds of things began to happen. The weather was not good. You know, they were delayed and all of that. And then they got to a particular location, a particular stop. And... Because the people didn't like the environment, they said, oh, this place is not nice and all of that. We let's just keep pushing and pushing to the next harbor so that we can stay there for the winter. But Paul, when he began to look at all of the things that began to happen, he, 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 he positioned his spirit in such a way that he could pick the truth behind what was happening. And he said, brethren, I perceive that this journey is going to be with a lot of harm if we continue. We are going to lose not only our properties, not only the ship, but even our lives will be at risk. But when the captain of the ship, you know, they looked at the weather, they looked at everything looks good, everything looks nice. They said, well, it doesn't make sense. What Paul is talking about doesn't make sense. And then they decided to proceed anyway. And just a little after they took off, a, a strange hurricane just hit the ship. And then everything just went haywire. You know, they lost everything. They lost their goods. They lost the ship. They lost everything. The only thing they didn't lose was their lives. And that was because the Lord himself, by his divine intervention, decided that he was going to preserve the life of everybody on that ship. And there's a lot of lessons to learn there that if only you can just trust the witness of the spirit that you receive on every situation, you will avoid so many unnecessary hardships, unnecessary losses in life. I said last week that as believers, the margin of error in our lives should be minimal. You should not be making mistakes. Every decision you, you make should not be wrong. 
if you are a spiritual person, and if you are someone who has who has who pays attention to discernment and who has built up this this faculty of discernment, every decision you make should not be wrong. Yes, we are humans; we make mistakes. There is always going to be room for that. But if nine out of ten decisions you are making is wrong, something is something something is out of place. So, as believers, we must desire that life of accuracy, that life of perfect alignment with God, and that life that really reflects the will and the purpose of God for our lives. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. The third benefit of discernment we looked at is that it can help us to avoid Satan's traps. And we looked at Acts chapter 16 last week from verse 16 to 18. That was a story of the lady who was possessed with the spirit of divination, who was following Paul and Silas and was prophesying and saying, oh, these people are the men of God. They've come to show us the way to salvation. You see, theologically speaking, there is nothing you can say about what she was saying. She was, she was actually correct. But when Paul looked beyond what she was saying and deciphered that mm, 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 mm. this is not the holy spirit this is not con this attitude is not consistent with the character of the holy spirit this behavior is not consistent with the character of the holy spirit because he became grieved in his spirit and then he turned to the lady and said come out of her that unclean spirit and immediately that demon came out of her and then she lost that ability and that was actually the situation that was what happened that they actually caught paul and silas and put them in the prison you know, and then they prayed and sang and then the Holy Ghost came down and all of that. But the point I'm making is, if Paul had not been discerning at that particular point in time, he could have made the mistake of incorporating that lady into the church, probably even giving her a key role, be expecting that, oh, because of her prophetic inclination, she'll be able to bring direction for the body of Christ. And at the end of the day, will have led the church into error. And that's the mistake that many churches have made today. They just see somebody, they don't check his background. They don't care about whether or not he was born again, how he got born again. They just saw that, oh, he has some gifts here and there. And then they put him in charge of the prayer team. They put him in charge of the choir. And then before you know it, people begin to die. People, all kinds of things begin to happen. Immorality begins to flood everywhere in the church. And the, the reason is just because we do not pay attention to discernment. We are too carried away just by the things we can see. But God makes us to understand that we must not judge by the sight of our eyes, but we must judge righteous judgment. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. So it can help you to avoid Satan's traps. The number four benefit of discernment is that it helps you to abide in the will of God. It helps you abide in the will of God. We read from Numbers chapter 9, verse 22 last week, where the Bible details the account of how the Lord led Israel from you know, the, from Egypt into the promised land, and the Lord was leading them by the cloud, all right? And because they understood the sign, which was the cloud, they knew what it meant. Anytime the cloud is moving, that is God signaling to them that it's time to go. And any direction that the cloud is moving, that is God signaling where they should go. And anytime the cloud stops moving, that's God signaling them to stay and to rest. And you see, for many believers, the reason why many believers have gotten into trouble today it's because they could not keep up with the signals. Now, just like somebody who is going in traffic and he saw a green light and then he went, he blasted through the intersection. And then he just lost focus and lost attention and he forgets that there are other, going to be other traffic lights on the road. And he's operating based on the last green light he saw, not caring about what is still going to happen. And then he gets to the next intersection without paying attention. He just continues going. And that's how many people get into accidents. Uh, many believers have gotten into accidents in life and destiny just because they could not pay attention to instructions per moment that helps them to abide in the will of God. When God told Abraham, Abraham, go and sacrifice your son in Mount Moriah, he got there, he carried the knife, was about to kill the boy. And then God said, stop. Many people only see the green light. They do not see the red light. They do not see when God says stop. And at the end of the day, they go on with the previous instruction, thinking they are in the will of God, not knowing that they have actually missed God because they could not discern what God was saying per time and per moment. The way you follow your GPS accurately and you depend on your GPS from the beginning of your trip, to the end of your trip. That is how we must depend on the Holy Spirit from the beginning of our journey as believers until we see Jesus on the last day. There will never be a point in our lives that will outgrow the need for the leading and the direction of the Holy Spirit because it will help us to abide in the will of God. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. The final one that I didn't talk about last week is that discernment can fast track your progress. Let's just read very quickly in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21. Isaiah 30, 21, it says, and your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right hand 
and when you turn to the left. What the scripture is basically saying is that when you position yourself to live for God, one of the benefits you have access to is that the Holy Spirit begins to operate as your GPS. Your GPS. When you get to an intersection, when you turn on your GPS, it tells you at the next intersection, turn right. When you get to the end of the road, if you need to make a, 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 a U-turn, or if you need to take the third exit, it tells you at the next intersection, take the third exit and continue on this road. Literally what the GPS does for us in our physical navigation, that is the assignment of the Holy Spirit for our spiritual navigation through life in order to fulfill the, our destiny. And what that does for you is that it will help you for, prevent a lot of time wastage. Because the principal reason why we waste time is usually because we don't know where we are going. If you know where you are going, your journey becomes faster. But the moment you do not know where you are going and you are guessing, I don't know how many of us have ever been in that situation where you were, you got to someplace, you went to a place for the first time and then you, you went back. And if you are somebody like me that doesn't remember, <laughs> remember the road until you have passed that place more like 50 times and you try to go there the second time, Maybe you had your GPS and something just happened, your phone died and you didn't have a car charger. And you were not trying to use your head to try and find, oh, where did I turn? Was it here? Was it left? Was it right? You see, you will second guess yourself at many junctions. And one of the consequences of that is that you will reduce your speed and your journey will be prolonged. So, but when we, when we, when we build this faculty of discernment and we make it a point of duty to await every signal the Holy Spirit brings to us on every decision that we make, then it helps to speed up our progress in life and in destiny. And I pray the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus Christ. So tonight we want to focus on another subheading. Next week, we are going to look at the steps we can actually take to actually build this faculty of discernment to take us from wherever we are to where we need to be in God. But for today, we just want to focus on the things that can actually kill this faculty of discernment. And also tonight, we are looking at the killers of discernment. You know, it's just as important to know the things that can hinder you as it is to know the things that can help you. You know, when you are going into a boxing match, one of the things you must do is to study your opponent. You need to know their strengths and their weaknesses. The, the reason why you need to know their strengths is so that you know how to mount your defense. The reason you need to know their weaknesses is so that you can know how to mount your offense. Because you will tailor your offense towards their weaknesses while you tailor your defense towards their strengths. That is how to win any battle in life. And so as we have known the benefit of discernment, we also need to know the things that can kill our ability to discern the truth behind every situation. As we deal with those issues, then when we now get to the steps we can take to supercharge or to, to boost our ability to discern the will of God in every situation, this will now be an, an additional uh, uh, support system in addition to you know all of the things we have discussed already. But like I said, tonight we are focusing on the killers of discernment. And I just pray, that if any of these things is in our lives, the Lord will help us and they will die off in the name of Jesus. The number one killer of discernment, according to scripture, is prayerlessness. Prayerlessness. Let's look at Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. We're going to read there from verse 41. Matthew 26. These are the words of Jesus himself. Matthew 26 verse 41. It says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. It says, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, what is Jesus saying here? I'm not going to go into the context, what happened here and all of that, but there is a, an instructive statement Jesus is making here for every believer in Christ who is going to fulfill purpose and who is going to please God. And Jesus is saying, in order for you to always make decisions that are pro-Christ, that are pro-God, that are pro-kingdom, one of the things that must not leave your life is watching and praying. I'm not going to focus on the watching part today. The watching part simply talks about setting up a system and a structure around your life, a defensive system and structure around your life that, are, that enables you, that enables that forces you to do the will of God, that forces you to do the right things, and that shields you from unnecessary temptation. That's a part of the watching. But my focus tonight is on the prayer aspect. You see, prayer is critically important for every believer in Christ. 
And the reason is because, you see, the moment you become born again, the Bible says, before we became born again, we were dead in sin. So your spirit man was dead when you were living in sin. But the moment you accepted Jesus as your Lord, one of the first things that happened to you was that the Holy Spirit was credited into your spirit. In fact, if you read, um, I think in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it was talking about how that the deposit of the Holy Spirit in our spirit is like the down payment that God gave to us to prove that everything else he has promised they will do. So the deposit of the Holy Spirit he has made in us is, is to among other things, provide a guarantee that God means what he says when he says he's going to take you to live with him eternally. All right? So when the Holy Spirit becomes deposited in your spirit, what happens to you is that the life of God is activated in you. So that life of God brings you to life. So now that your spirit man is alive, there are things you need to do with your spirit in order for your spirit to stay alive, not just alive, but healthy. And one of those things is prayer prayer for example when you pray in tongues the Bible makes us to understand that it is not your mouth that is praying it is not your mind that is praying it is your spirit that is praying he said for when i speak in an unknown tongue he said my spirit prayer but my understanding is on fruit and don't forget the bible says in luke chapter 18 verse 1 that men not always to pray and not to face so the, based on the configuration of man one of the ways you charge your spirit just think about it like you have a cell phone and your cell phone uses a battery, all right? There are so many things that cell phone is capable of doing. It has so many potentials, all right? But when that cell phone loses power, suddenly its potentials become limited. I don't know if your phone is like mine. When my battery level gets to some point, it won't even allow the camera to work. It will just tell you, sorry, the, back, the camera is too low to operate. The, the battery is too low to operate the camera at this time. So if you meet me at that particular time and you say, oh, can you help me take this picture? And I tell you, oh, sorry, my phone cannot take this picture. It's not because my phone does not have the potential to, but because the level of power that is available in my phone at that time does not support what I am trying to achieve with my phone at that time. And that is something also that every one of us must become aware of. There are many things that we desire. Oh, how I wish I could do this. Oh, how I wish I could do that. Oh, I wish I was more like this person. Oh, I wish I was more like that person. It's not as if you can't become it. But the issue is the le requisite level of charging, level of power generation that needs to be done in you for you to be able to achieve that possibility, you have not yet accomplished it. And the principal way you charge your human spirit is by prayer. Let's look at the book of Jude. Jude verse 20. Jude verse 20. It says, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, how? Praying in the Holy Ghost. So the way you build yourself is by praying principally in the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues. When you pray in the Spirit, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, when I pray in tongues, he says, my spirit prayer, and he says, I, I am edified. He says, that prayer in an unknown tongue, edified himself. The word edifies is, is from the same root word as edifice. Edifice, you build an edifice. It's like brick upon brick, brick upon brick. So the way you build your spirit, man, is by subjecting your spirit to prayer to prayer. A prayerless believer will usually be a believer who is bankrupt of discernment. When you're somebody who is always making mistakes, and I want us to just assess our lives. Think about the times you made the, the worst mistakes in your life, and then correlate it with your prayer life at the time. You will usually discover that your prayer life is usually directly proportional to the degree of your discernment. So the more you pray, the, high, the more heightened your discernment faculties become. And the less you pray, the more deadened your spiritual faculties in, in terms of discernment, the more deadened they become. Because prayer is the power that charges your human spirit in order for you to be able to pick different frequencies. I hope you understand that your human spirit is the only link that you have between this earth realm and the spirit realm. 
So your spirit man has the capacity to traffic between the spirit realm and the human realm. That's why sometimes you know some things because they happen, not necessarily because the Holy Spirit spoke to you, but because your spirit also has access to the spirit realm and can see things before they happen and can pick things before they happen. But when you do not charge your spirit sufficiently, even though it knows things, it won't be able to communicate it to you because it does not have enough power for that functionality. That is why it is critical. That's why when you pray, you don't pray because you feel like it. You don't pray because you are in the mood. You pray because it, 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 you, you need it for life. It's as simple as that. Because there are situations where you cannot wait till you go to sleep before you know what God is saying. You need to know what the will of the Lord is on the spot. And the way you do that is by keeping your spirit man charged. And the principal way of doing that is by maintaining a prayerful lifestyle. So the first killer of discernment is prayerlessness. When you indulge in prayerlessness, it's not just an issue of um, God being angry with you or maybe you fall into sin. When you are prayerless, the principal thing that prayerlessness does to you is that it kills your spiritual sensitivity and then it makes you more vulnerable to spiritual attacks and spiritual traps. I pray the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. The second killer of discernment in that regard is wordlessness. Wordlessness. Let's look at the book of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4. I'll read from verse 1. This is the story of the temptation of Jesus. He says, Then was Jesus led up to the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Look at verse 4. He says, But he answered, he being Jesus, he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And if you read, proceed further to the downward verses, for example, if you look verse 7 again, it says, Jesus said to him again, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. If you read further again, in verse 10, he says, Jesus said to him again, Get thee end, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord your God, and him only shall thou say. So every single time Satan came with a temptation, Jesus combated him with the written word. You see, the first level of discernment, the most basic level of discernment is furnished by the word. Now, I did say, you know, last week and even today, there are some times that some things happen and there is no scripture you can use to fault it. For example, the, the, the story that happened in Acts chapter 16, you know, when that lady came, you know, with the spirit of the nation and was prophesying accurately that, oh, these people are the uh, servants of God. They've come to show us the way to salvation and all of that. There is no scripture on X you can use to prove that is wrong. All right. But that's the second level. But the first and the most basic level of discernment is furnished by the word. What does the Bible say about this? Let's say, Someone is bringing a proposal to you and the proposal is that you have to steal or you have to cheat or you have to lie. You have to defraud in order to get a benefit. That's the proposal. But when you understand what God's stand is based on his word on that particular issue, you don't even need to go and pray because you know what the Bible says on that issue. What does the Bible say about stealing? Does the Bible excuse stealing? The answer is no. Does the Bible excuse defrauding? Does he excuse lying? The answer is no. Because you are full of the word, what it does to you is that it gives you the primary level of defense against the tricks of the devil. So you are able to easily spot the trap of the devil and say, no, this is not consistent with the will of God. This cannot be God because this is contradicting the word of God. But when you do not have the word of God abiding in you, when you don't study the word, when you don't know what the word says, when you don't know what God's position is on different issues, then everything becomes subjective. Everything comes down to how you feel about it. Everything comes down to what your mood is at a particular time, about a particular situation. And that is a very, very dangerous way to live. Because if the basis of your decision-making is emotion, if the basis of your decision-making is not defined and rooted in the word of God, you will get many decisions wrong. Many decisions. And that's the reason why the world is going into chaos today. You see people, <laughs> you know, I was listening to a podcast the other day, and one lady was saying, you know, 
the LGBTQ, whatever, the letters just keep increasing <laughs> and increasing and increasing, and it looks as if there will never be an end to it. You see, that is what happens when you remove the knowledge of God from yourself. You begin to you to, to, to just tumble in darkness. Tumble in darkness. When God has already given you this position, He has already given you the truth, He has already given you what to do. The moment you do not either know what God has said or you reject what God has said, then you dive into confusion. And that is that is the situation that many people have found themselves in today. But when we fill ourselves with the word of God, He provides the first leverage. When Satan is bringing an idea to you, you see, when you, there is a realm that you study the scripture to, that you begin to think in scriptures. Even when you joke, you joke in scripture. I, I, I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Like, every idea that pops out of your mind is always resonating the scriptures. You think in scriptures. You talk in scriptures. You act in scriptures. That is how the Lord wants us to be. And that is the principal level of defense that is available to us against the tricks of the devil. But if you do not have the word of God abiding in you, then you fall cheap prey to the tricks of the devil. And your capacity to discern God's will will be greatly limited i pray god will help us in jesus name the third killer of discernment is pride pride let's look at the book of james chapter 4 and this is a very very big deal james chapter 4 verse 6 he says but he gives more grace wherefore he said god resisted the proud but giveth grace to the humble do you see this yeah. this sounds like a simple scripture but it's, it has great and profound implications. Now, what the scripture is saying is that as far as the generosity, in fact, if you read NLT, it says God gives grace generously. That's God's position. As far as his willingness to give is concerned, God is generous. He's willing to give you more grace than you even need. In fact, if you read Acts chapter, um, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the Bible says we should come boldly to the throne of grace so that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So there is no limit to how much grace God can release to you. But when you allow pride to enter your heart, and you begin to consider the idea that anything that you have or something, there is something in your life that you have that is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is based on your capacity or ability and not God. The moment you begin to think like that and say, oh, I work so hard. That is the reason why I'm, I'm rich. <laughs> Go to Africa. <laughs> there are people who work harder than you. <laughs> and yet they don't, they don't have enough to even get by. So... Before you consider that idea that it is something you did that made you to have or to become what you have, quickly shut that spirit down. That is the spirit of pride. It's the spirit of pride. When you begin to get to that situation where nobody can correct you, you 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 are the you are the <laughs> you are the all-knowing personality. <laughs> you are right and everybody else is wrong. <laughs> that is a spirit of pride at work. One of the symbols of humility is teachability. You can listen to people. Even people who are younger than you. Even people who seemingly are less than you in status. Look at the case of Naaman, for example. He was because of a maid, a slave girl, that they brought from Israel to his house. That was serving his wife. Because of a slave girl, that he was able to get his healing. He was able to listen. He was humble enough to listen to even a slave who said, oh, if you go to this man of God, you can be healed. And then he listened and then he obeyed. If you do not, if you get to that point in your life that you can no longer listen to counsel, then you're already on a dangerous path. If you look at the book of Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, I won't read it because of time, but you can just write it down. Proverbs 16, 18. The Bible says, pride goeth before destruction. Pride is a precursor. You know, I don't know how many of us are familiar with biological sciences, but in biology, we talk about precursors a lot. We say, oh, um, the, 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 this is a precursor of this enzyme, or this is a precursor of this protein, and all of that. A precursor is something that is a forerunner. It comes first. But over time, when you subject it to a particular condition, something else will emerge from it. In the same way, when you're not spried in your heart, and you get to that point where you cannot give God all the glory for anything that happens in your life and everything you become. The moment you get to that point where you are ashamed to give all the glory to God, you're already falling into the stain of pride. And when you fall into pride, it's a dangerous thing because the Bible says God himself will be the one to fight you. That's what the Bible is saying in that James chapter 4 verse 6. It says God resists the proud. See, 
when Satan is fighting you, <laughs> you don't have too much problem <laughs> because you can use the name of Jesus. You can use the blood of Jesus. You can use the authority of the word. But you see, when God is fighting you, <laughs> you are in trouble because there is nobody you want to report God to. Which court do you want to take God to? Which court? When Job summoned God and he said, oh, that God will stand before me and, you know, I will plead my case before you show him how righteous I am. <laughs> when God appeared <laughs> in Job chapter 38, the book, the book first asked him a few questions. He said, I want to test your understanding to see if you and I can even engage in a debate. If you and I can even go to court. He said, where were you when I formed the foundations of the world? Declare if you have understanding. Where were you when the sons of God were singing into the foundations of the world? Where were you? Do you know where I, I put the, 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 the floodgates that blocks the river from overflowing? He said, declare if you have understanding. Because when you are going to engage God, God in court, it means he must have the same level of understanding that he does. And Job was, he got to a, a point. Job said, I covered my mouth. <laughs> I said, I cannot talk again. God just have mercy on me. So there is no court on earth or in heaven or in any dispensation or in any dimension you want to take God to. So when God decides to fight you, you are in trouble. Because number one, the, you need grace to be saved. You need grace to remain saved. So if you do not have access to grace, you are already in trouble. <laughs> because before you can even get grace, you must get mercy. That's what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. He says when you come to the throne of grace, the only way you will be admitted is because mercy will first be sprinkled on you, which is symbolic of the blood. You will obtain mercy first. It is because of the mercy. You are not even qualified to get the grace in the first place. It is the mercy you obtain that now allows you to be able to access the throne of grace. Now that you have become proud, the first thing God will withdraw is mercy. The next thing that we withdraw is grace. And once mercy is withdrawn in your life, you're already headed for destruction. Because the Bible says in Lamentation chapter 3, verse 22, it says, it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his compassion fails not. So it is the mercy of God that, that serves as your insurance, insurance system as you go through life. So you make mistakes and, you know, things happen here and there. The mercy of God comes and says, son, it's okay. Son, you can move on. Son, it's all right. But when you lose that mercy, you're already head there. So the reason why the proud man will actually be destroyed is because he will lose the mercy of God and he will lose the grace of God. And that is a terrible state to be in. So whenever the Satan is trying to tempt you with pride, fight it like a plague. Remember, Satan was not cast down from heaven because of immorality. He was not cast down from heaven for lying. He was not cast down from heaven from stealing. He was cast down because of pride. Because of pride. If pride can make God to cast down the king, the, 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 the chief of the angels, then there is nothing that pride cannot, cannot, cannot do negatively in the life of a man. So we must fight pride like a plague because that is exactly what it is. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. And then number four killer of the sermon finally is impatience and desperation. My time is already up. I wish I could open some scriptures here, but we can just write it down. Let's write down 1 Samuel chapter 15. Uh, sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 13 from verses 5 to 14. And then we can also write down Genesis chapter 25 from verses 29 to 34. So what happened in 1 Samuel chapter 13 was that, you know, the children of Israel were to go to war with the Philistines and then Saul was the king, you know. And then, you know, Samuel told him, wait for seven days, I'm going to come. I will offer the sacrifice. Meanwhile, it is only the priest that has the divine authorization to offer an acceptable sacrifice to God. Now, Saul was only a king. He was not a priest. So it was not his place to offer sacrifice. He had to wait for Saul. But after he waited, according to him, he said, oh, I've waited for the seven days. I didn't see you. And then I saw that the people were running away. You know, I didn't want to be alone. I didn't want to feel, you know, weak and all of that. So I forced myself to offer the sacrifice. And the Bible says, immediately as he finished offering the sacrifice, Samuel came. Immediately. And that's how the devil works. Just before your breakthrough comes, Satan will come and bring an alternative to you and say, why don't you settle for less? Why, why, if this one is good enough, why don't you settle for this one? And that's how many believers have settled for less than what they can be in Christ. Because they could not be patient. Because they, they got to the point. I've, I don't know if you have ever heard somebody say something like, oh, I, I don't care. The next man, maybe as a lady, I'm, I'm already 30 years old. The next man that comes to me, I don't care whether he's a Muslim. I don't care whether he's an atheist. I don't care whether he's a murderer. <laughs> I must marry. <laughs> you see, God, will not, God won't fight you. 
God won't stop you. But if you, you allow desperation and impatience to lure you into evil, you will be the one to bear the consequences. When you decide for a for example, as a Christian to marry a Muslim, and you say, oh, it's because time, I'm, I've lost time, you know, I want to have kids and all of that, you are not thinking ahead into the future. Okay, when the kids become old, who will they serve? <laughs> is it Jesus they will serve, or is it Allah? Now, when the time now comes, and the husband is saying, no, I want my kids to serve Allah, and you are coming and saying, you want my kids to serve Jesus, that in itself is an irreconcilable difference. But you are not thinking about that. And he just, I just want it now. I just want that was the same thing that happened to Esau. He said, Oh, I'm about to die. <laughs> oh, I wish I could open this scripture. He came to Jesus to Jacob. He said, Jacob, give me that stew. Give me that stew. I'm hungry. I'm about to die. <laughs> what statement is that? Biologically speaking, a human body is known to be able to survive even up to two months without food. As long as you have access to water, you will survive, you'll be fine. But if, my question is, Esau, have you have you fasted for two months? <laughs> you just went out in the morning. You came back in the evening. You didn't catch any animal in your hunt, and then you saw somebody cooking for. I said, "I'm, I'm about, I'm about to die. <laughs> Please take my birthright and give me food." And he lost his birthright. Bible says he despised his birthright and he lost the blessing because of it. Impatience and desperation. It can kill your discernment. God will be trying to speak to you. God will be trying to lead you. Don't go in that. But you won't hear because you're already desperate. Never allow desperation to enter your heart for anything whatsoever. Whether I don't care whether it's money, but whatever it is. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, it says, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And it says, The peace of God that passes all understanding will flood your heart. Philippians 4, verses 6 to 8. That's the powerful scripture. It doesn't matter what you are going through. It doesn't matter how bogus it looks. Satan is a master at exaggerating things. He's a master at it. So when Satan is trying to exaggerate things for you, trying to get you to be impatient and desperate, you say, no, that is not my life. And then you go to God. You channel your frustration to God in prayer. And then you allow the peace of God to flood your heart. When that peace comes, it comes with discernment. It comes with direction. It comes with revelation. It comes with instruction. I hope the Lord has spoken to us tonight. Can we just go to the Lord in prayer for the next few seconds and say, Lord, help me. Help me. Help me. Help me to get rid of all these killers of discernment in my life. Help me to get rid of prayerlessness. Help me to get rid of wordlessness. Help me to get rid of pride. Help me, Lord Jesus, to get rid of impatience and desperation. Father, help me to get rid of all these things. I don't know what your own issue is specifically, but the Lord has spoken to us generally tonight. But what is that thing that the Lord has pointed your own attention to? Maybe your own issue is pride. You've, you've gotten to the point where you think you are the most beautiful person in the world. Therefore, nobody can talk to you again. You think you are the most successful person in the world. Therefore, nobody can advise you again. You've gotten to the point where you think it is because of your hard work that you, 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 you've gotten to the realm you have gotten into, not knowing that there are people who work harder than you and they don't have half of what you have. Can you just ask God for mercy and say, Lord, be merciful unto me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, Lord Jesus. Have mercy on me. I repent of my pride. I repent of impatience. I repent of desperation. I repent of shutting down your spirit when I ought to be patient. I've met, just gotten headlong into so many problems that I could not bring myself out of. Father, have mercy. Maybe you are already suffering the consequence of, of, of lack of discernment. Can you ask God to have mercy on you? And say, Father, have mercy. Have mercy. I know I've made this mistake already, but can you please have mercy on me? Can you please show me mercy? Show me mercy. Show me mercy. Show me mercy, O Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. For in Jesus' name, we have prayed. Before we close tonight, I'd like to give opportunity to anyone who wants to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior? You see, your faculty of discernment is only activated when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So if you are there tonight, you like to make that decision, or you just want to rededicate your life to the Lord tonight, can you just place your hand on your chest and just repeat this simple prayer after me, but mean it from the depth of your heart. Just tell him, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge myself as a sinner, and I know I cannot save myself. I know you died to set me free. Lord Jesus, wash my sins away. Come into my heart. Become my Lord and my Savior. From this day, I confess you as my Lord and my Savior. I declare that I will live for you and you alone for the rest of my life. Give me the grace to go and to sin no more.
Thank you, Jesus, because you have saved me. For in Jesus' mighty name we've prayed. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for your word that you are sent to us. Father, I pray for those who have decided to accept you as Lord and Savior. I pray that you wash their sins away in the name of Jesus. And I pray that the life of God becomes activated in them right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray for every one of us, the grace, oh God, to be discerning people, to be, to be sensitive to the movements of your spirit. And the grace to eliminate all these killers of discernment in our spirit. Father, I pray you grant unto us in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that you show us mercy. In any way, we have already gone astray, made bad, terrible, destiny-destroying decisions. Father, I pray that your mercy will speak for us in the name of Jesus. Father, as we go into this week, let your presence go with us. Let your glory be revealed in our lives and let us return with thanksgiving. For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed.